Amen. Amen. Who's excited to be here today? Amen. Amen. We have to be excited to be here. It's a privilege to be in his house. It's a privilege to be in his presence. Yes. Amen. Back then, they had to go through ceremonies and anointings and hours of stuff, I imagine. Hours, hours. Just, to, just for one priest to be in the Holy of Holies. But we get to walk in here today and just be in His presence. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to get right into it today. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to open up to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. And while you do that, um, I'd like to thank God for the opportunity to be here speaking to you all. Um, it's, it's an amazing honor. It's an amazing privilege. And I give honor to... Uh, to my pastor and to Stephen for this opportunity and and uh, to my grandpa and my grandma who are here, amen. It's awesome seeing them. So Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 through 7 it says this. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Amen? I have titled the word that God has for you today, The Age of Calling. Can you say that with me today? Say, the age of calling. Amen? God has called us. Amen? Praise God. God has called us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today giving you all the honor and all the glory, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we are here, Lord, for your word. We are here, Lord, to worship you, to praise you. In Jesus' name, I pray that there would be freedom in this place, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I bind every distraction, Lord Jesus, every spirit, Lord Jesus, that would seek to take away from your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that we would be set free to worship. In Jesus' name, you have made us free. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may take your seats. So, really really quickly, there's going to be um, some context that I'm going to give. What is happening here in Jeremiah chapter 1? Right? We see that we see that God is calling upon Jeremiah, right? God is calling upon Jeremiah. He tells him, God tells Jeremiah that in the womb, he formed him in the womb, and that he knew him before he was born. Amen? That is amazing. He, he knew him before he was born. And God knows us before anyone else does. Before anyone sees you, and you're a newborn baby before you have all your friends and your family. It's just you and God. And God sees you. He sees your potential. He knows the plans that he thinks towards you. Amen? And he, he's, he's calling Jeremiah. He tells him that he was already, already ordained in the womb to be a prophet. In the womb, he was ordained. That is amazing. That is amazing. Praise God, because... He already has a calling for us right. in, our, in our mother's wombs. Before we even know what life is, before we can even talk, he says, I can use him. I can use her. Amen? So he tells Jeremiah that he was already ordained. But there's one thing, there's one thing. Jeremiah has one excuse to God. Jeremiah has one excuse on why he can't be used. He says, Ah, oh, Lord God, Behold, I cannot speak. I cannot speak, for I am a youth. For I am a youth. Amen? Ah, oh, Jesus, that sounds amazing. Your plans for me, they sound amazing, but I'm only 19. Oh, Jesus, that is a powerful plan. That's, a, that's an amazing plan, but I'm only 15. Oh, Jesus, that is awesome but I'm 60 years old already. Oh, Jesus. Wow, you want to use me in that way? But I'm 80 years old. And how often do we have these excuses towards God on what He can't do because of us? Amen? But I know that I serve a limitless God today. Amen? I know that I serve a God who has no boundaries, who has no holds. Amen? 
And I'm, I'm not sure how young Jeremiah was, but I'm sure that we can all relate to what he said to God. I am a youth. I am too young. But we see that God says this. He says, don't say it that you're a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. We create these excuses, and God's telling us, don't give me that excuse. Don't give me that excuse. There's no reason to not serve him. There's no reason to not work in your calling. There's no reason to not give him your life today. There's no reason. That's what he's telling us. Don't say that. That's what he told Jeremiah. Don't say that you're a youth. Say yes. Yeah. And this message today is titled The Age of Calling in order to clear up a common misconception. Jeremiah was sanctified by God and ordained before his mother knew him. Yet we seem to think that we need to be a certain age to fulfill our calling. We seem to think that we need certain achievements to work in our calling. Like if, like if this is some video game that we're playing. I haven't unlocked that yet. This isn't a video game. This is life and death that we live every day. And God is calling you for something greater than you can understand. And we tend to make the excuse that we are not yet of age. We tend to make the excuse, I need to get a steady job first. Then I will make time for God. I need to get married first. Then I will work in my calling. I need to get my degree first. Then I will focus on my ministry. What are we doing? We're putting God second, third, fourth, fifth. But he's not first in our lives. But that is what he should be every waking moment of every day. God should be first. And somehow we have allowed the world to push back everything that God is trying to push forward in our lives. God gives us opportunities. Wait, hold on, hold on. Not, not me, not me. Send someone else. I'm a youth. Wait, not me. I don't, I don't have that degree yet. Wait, not me. I don't have the experience I need. You will never be sufficient. You will never be enough because you are human. And you should take comfort in that because we have a God who is exceedingly, abundantly, amen? It doesn't matter what our condition is. It doesn't matter what we think of ourselves. It matters what He thinks of me. It matters what He sees when He looks at me and He is proud of His son and His daughter. When He looked at us in the womb and He had a plan, yet we seem to have all these excuses of why we're not good enough. We'll never be good enough, church. We don't deserve his blessings. We don't deserve the plans that he thinks towards us. But he does it anyway because he is good. Because he is a good father, amen? Can someone give God praise today for that? Amen. And I'm here to tell you today, God is trying to tell you today that you are being called now. You are being called now, church. God is trying to tell us something today. He's trying to tell us something. Will we, will we grasp it? Will we grasp it? God is telling us that he already has a plan for us. He's had this plan since before he created everything. He's had this plan. He's known. He has known, church. He is omniscient. He knows all things. Esther 4.14, it says, For if you remain completely silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? For such a time as this. That is why we are here. For such a time as this. Before he created everything, he knew what was going to go on today in this world. He knew what problems you were going to face. He knew what problems America was going to face. He knew what the devil was going to try to do. Amen? But somehow we, we keep God in such a small box of understanding. God is not limited. God is limitless. Amen? And he knows all things. The very thought of God being mindful of me, the very idea that he has a purpose for me makes everything else seem so much smaller. The fact that a God that great thinks about me and says, you know what, I can use him in that way. 
I can use her in this way. She would be perfect for that. Amen? Have we lost all, all gratefulness? Have we lost all thankfulness for, for what he's doing? Are we just sitting back and letting life go by us? Risking life and death eternally? Is that what we're doing? No, we are called to work in our purpose. We are called to live the way God wants us to live. Amen? And when I think about this, I think about David. Amen? As a young person, King David is one of the greatest inspirations that we can look to. Amen? As a young person, he is a great example. And we can see in 1 Samuel 16 that Samuel, right, is sent by God to anoint the next king of Israel, God's people. And David's seven brothers, seven of his brothers, had passed in front of Samuel and were each denied the anointing. His seven older brothers went to show off what they were, all their accomplishments and achievements. Ah, oh, let's see, God's going to anoint me. Nope, 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 seven times until it got to the youngest one. Amen? Imagine Samuel. Oh, this one, God, this one. God, nope. Oh, this one, maybe. This one. Nope. Ah, oh, well, surely this one, Jesus. Or, sorry, not Jesus. God, he, he's the smartest. Nope. Until there was only one brother left, one child, the forgotten one that no one else cared for. The forgotten one that no one else was thinking about. Why? Because he was a shepherd tending the sheep. Sometimes we think about that, right? No one's thinking about me. No one cares about me. No one sees what I do. I could die right now and it wouldn't make a difference. That is a lie from the devil. The devil is a liar, church. And God has a plan that he thinks towards you. And in 1 Samuel 16, 11 through 13, it says this. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So the youngest, the shepherd, the forgotten one, the one that no one cared to think about, was anointed king. Anointed king of God's people. I know that this is speaking to someone. The one that was forgotten was anointed king. Amen. And in the very next chapter, we see how far God can take you in a short amount of time, if you are willing. Because in the next chapter, he fights Goliath. And in chapter 17 of Samuel 1, we see that Goliath had been terrorizing the Israelites. And no one wanted to face him. No one was bold enough. No one had enough faith in God. None of David's brothers, none of Israel's soldiers, not even King Saul would approach Goliath. But David, with all his hunger, David, with all his faith, David, with his young age, he faces Goliath. And in 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47, it says this, Then David said to the Philistines, You, sorry, to the Philistine Goliath, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord God does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Does someone believe that for you today? 
Does someone believe that for your situation today? Does someone believe that we serve the Lord of hosts? That the enemy comes with a sword and with a spear, taunting. But God comes with something else. God comes with his plans, with the victory that he has already thought of, that he has already placed in our lives. Yet we have so many excuses. Yet we doubt ourselves so much. And we limit God in our lives. We limit God. You think God has abandoned you? You have abandoned Him. He is calling you today. He is calling you. And you see, church, this is what we are called to do. We are called to share this good news like David did. We are called to speak life in this way. We must have faith in this way. We must have victory declared in our lives, just like David declared it in his life. He hadn't won yet, but he knew he was going to win. Because of God, not because of him. Glory be to God. You're in your situation, you don't know who's going to win. I'm telling you today, God will win. God is always the winner. There is no competition for God. There is no competition for God. Don't limit him. Do not limit him in your situation. And we must have victory declared, not just for ourselves, but for others. Do you realize that David declared victory for Israel, not for himself, for a whole nation? And we can't even hope for ourselves. We can't even hope for our own situation, but God has plans to use you for a whole nation. God has plans to use you for nations, but we're here complaining about our, our daily life, about, I don't know, what are we complaining about? I complain about like, food, I'm not sure. <laughs> about homework. Yeah, actually I do complain about homework. So in 1 Samuel 17, verse 49, it says this, then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on the face of the earth. Goliath. He killed Goliath. He had the victory. But if he had listened, if he had listened to the people in his life, it would not be so. If David would have chosen to limit his calling, David wouldn't have killed the life. In church, people will try to discourage you. People are going to tell you that you're not meant to do what God has called you to do. The enemy will try to discourage you and say that you aren't worthy enough, that you are a youth that you are too young, too old, too whatever it might be. But young people, even though the enemy will keep discouraging you, God has a greater plan. Amen? Right. And the reason the enemy attacks the youth so much, listen up, youth, the reason you are attacked so much in your young years in your young age is because the enemy has figured out that if he has the church's young people, he has the future of the church. The enemy is not dumb. He has figured out that if he has the church's young people, he can limit the revival. He has figured out that if he can get the young people to backslide, that he can cut that church's life short. I think I almost saw it in this church. I think I almost saw every young person dead. Because I was in that position. And I wasn't willing to do what God had called me to do. I was in my sin. And I preferred it that way. And he will get you to fall into fornication now. He'll get you to fall into witchcraft now. He'll get you to fall into pride now. He'll get you to serve other gods now. Because then he has the church limited. 
Because he has the young people. He has the church limited because he has the young people. But I know that there's some young people in here that are willing to fight. Amen? I know that there is at least one young person in here that is willing to run the race. I know that there is at least one person here today that knows where their treasures lie. Not here on earth, but there in heaven. Amen? I know. Who am I preaching to today, church? Who am I preaching to? The young people, I know that there's someone here that knows the God that they serve, that isn't willing to sit back in their situation, complacent. So we see that before David fought Goliath, people tried to stop him. And the enemy tried to keep him from his calling. The first was David's oldest brother, Eliab. In 1 Samuel 17, 28, it says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. Then he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Eliab acted like he knew what David was doing. You just came here because of pride. And people would say that about you. You're doing all this for your own good. Wow. The people that you are closest to, his oldest brother, the people that you look up to. I look up to my older siblings. David probably looked up to his oldest brother. And that's what he told David when he came down, because of his faith. You came here because of pride. And then King Saul, the king of Israel, tried to discourage David. The man with the most power, with the most authority or influence, tried to limit David's calling. In verse 33 it says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You are not able to go against that Philistine. You are a youth. You are a youth. I know what the enemy tries to tell me. I know what hell says about me. I know what lies the world is trying to tell you. You know that your family might not believe in you. You know that your family might not see the way you see things. And maybe all that is said about you is negative. They say you're too young. They say you're not experienced enough. But here is what God is telling us. Are you ready? Are you ready? This is what God is telling us. In Jeremiah 1st uh, chapter 7 through 8, it says, But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Do not say that I am a youth. Do not say that. Oh, God is not done yet. Somebody has to praise God today for this. Somebody has to praise God today. God is not done yet. It's not you said it says, Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This is what David, sorry, this is what God was telling Jeremiah. And this is what God is telling us. What are we called to do? Over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. It doesn't matter what your family says. It doesn't matter what your friends say. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what sins you have committed. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. Because God is calling you today. Because God has a calling over your life. We are called to fulfill it. We are called to fulfill His calling. Whatever capacity it might be. But too often we say, I am a youth. But too often we have this excuse of, 
I'm not good enough. Too often, we try to limit God. Please stand with me today, church, as I, as I conclude. God has called us to root out the evil in our lives and to pull down the strongholds of the enemy. He has called us to destroy the enemy's lies and his plans and to throw down every evil that lingers in our midst. But more importantly, he has called us to build upon him our firm foundation and to plant seeds that will spring up life in ourselves and others. Like that verse says, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Forget about your age, church. Forget about your excuses. Give them up. Give them up to God. Because the truth is, you will never be good enough. So might as well serve Him now. Yeah. Might as well give Him everything now. I thought the same way you did. I have time. I'm young. I can sin some more. Mm. I have time. I'm young. There's still things I haven't done yet. But if you could see what he sees when he looks at you. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see you mourning in your situation. He sees all the plans that he has for you. When God looks at you, he looks at you with love. He looks at you with love and with hope and with belief. Our God is a faithful God. He knows what He wants for you. He knows what's best for you. Give it to Him. Give it to God today. It is your only hope. It is your only reason for living. It's Jesus. Jesus is your reason for living. So what we must do is give up our excuses and repent for not wanting God the way that we should. Sometimes I don't want God the way I should want God. Sometimes I'm not willing to pray. Sometimes I'm not willing to fast. Doesn't matter what you want. What matters is how good He is. What matters is what He's done for you. He's given His life for you. Amen? Come to the altar today. Come to the altar today, church. And today we're going to embrace His plan. Today we're going to embrace His calling. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, Lord.